Thanks for joining us tonight for a very important film. I'm Pat Riley of Solus Nua, an Irish arts organization in Washington, D.C. Solus Nua means new light in Irish. Um, we are here because of a partnership with the New York University, D.C. Dialogues series. Uh, thank you, Tom McIntyre, the director of that series, and thank you to Polly, who coordinates these events for us. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to turn off your cell phones at this point, if you can. And um, I, thanks to the generosity of Culture Ireland, we have with us tonight the subject of the film, Tommy Riekenthal and Irene Weiss, who is also in the film, and they will be introduced throughout the evening. Uh, but thank you to Culture Ireland for that. I'm going to turn it over to Jerry Gregg, the Irish director of this film, Condemned to Remember. Thank you. Well, I'd also like to echo Pat's praise for Polly Tercian and Tom McIntyre, and also yourself, Pat, and Michael Carlin, and all that on Solis Newer for. You've been a great champion of this film and the previous film for several years now, and I want to set the context. I was told today that this is a day of history in Washington. Well, you're, one man stopped me on the way in, he said it was a very sad day. Well, let me just set a bit of context for the film. 74 years ago this month, the subject of the film, Tommy Reichenthal, was on the run. He was hiding under an assumed name, Tommy Vida, on assumed identity papers, far from his uh, native village of Merisice, in, in the capital of Slovakia, Bratislava. He was nine years of age, and eventually he was captured by the Gestapo, and he was beaten before his brother Mickey, who was also under an assumed name, Mickey Vida, said, stop beating them. OK, we're Jews. Um, at the same time, our other survivor tonight, and he was also in the film, Irene Weiss, was in Auschwitz. She celebrated her 14th birthday in Auschwitz, if celebrated is the word. She was a slave laborer, and she was still haunted by the memory that is recounted in the film of being separated from her mother and siblings the moment they arrived on the platform at Auschwitz in 1944. So it took six months before Tommy was eventually freed by the British Army in April 1945. And three years ago, we presented the film Close to Evil to American audiences. And that film dealt with Tommy's quest to meet one of his SS jailers from Bergen-Belsen. Tonight's film is a sequel to that film. I'm just, so I'm just setting the context so you know what's happening. But this film took a different direction from the direction. We thought we were going to make a film perhaps about the last Nazi trial. Irene probably testified at one of the last Nazi trials when the so-called bookkeeper of Auschwitz was convicted, Oskar Gruning, and he died earlier this year uh, before he actually managed to uh, serve a day in custody. So our narrative focus had to shift because Europe shifted in 2016. Suddenly, Europe was overrun, to use the phrase, by hundreds of thousands of people fleeing war and persecution, murder and rape. And Tommy said to me, when we were in Germany, he said, you know, there's a lot of echoes here of what was happening to me when I was nine or 10 years of age. 
and we shifted the focus of the film and it became a much more contemporary piece. Our quest to understand what was happening took us to Poland, took us to Tommy's native Slovakia, and took us eventually to Bosnia, Herzegovina. And there we discovered the relevance of William Faulkner's great insight, the past is not dead, the past is not even the past. I'm not going to say any more about the film, but we look forward to talking to you at the end of the film about the issues and themes raised. But I just wanted to say that's the context. There is another uh, Polish-American character in the film, and he very much inspired us, Thomas, Jan Thomas Gross. He gave us the inspiration to explore what he's called the crisis of shame. So there was a crisis of shame in Europe in 2015, 2016. And the question we ask, has that crisis of shame spread to other parts of the world? So thank you for coming tonight. Thank you again, uh, Pat and all that on Sullis New to show this is a different light shown by Irish filmmakers and uh, citizens like Tommy. And again, this is the first public screening of this film on American soil. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Suzanne Lynch. I'm the correspondent for the Irish Times here in Washington. I'm going to just chair uh, the conversation now for the next while. Um, I'm joined on stage, as you can see, um, by Jerry, the director of the film, Tommy, our protagonist, if I may call you that, and Irene, who also <laughs> featured in the film. Given the powerful scenes we just have witnessed, I'm, I don't want to break the mood in a sense um, because it's, it's such a moving and, and pretty overwhelming piece of, of film. So I think I'm going to start, um, Jerry, by maybe asking you just to, there's so much in this, but the one theme, if you like, is the parallels throughout the, the film and, and Tommy meeting individuals who were a witness to different parts of history. Um, and it's almost like it's a piece of string. You start off watching it and it begins with, with Tommy's story as a Holocaust survivor and we're all kind of familiar, we think, enough with that story. Mm. And then all of a sudden it brings you places that you weren't expecting to go. Uh, to, the, to Syria, mm. to the borders of Europe, to Germany, and then Srebrenica. Was this what you had planned to do when you, when you made the film? Did you think it was going to go this way? No. It was supposed to be a, you know, a sequel to your first film, but, but tell me how, how you guys arrived at this point. Uh, well, as I said at the start, we, we Close to Evil deals with Tommy's quest, the, the prequel to this film deals with Tommy's quest to find the SS woman. And when we discovered that the SS woman was involved in a death march from this network of camps called Gross Rosen, we thought when we were asked to make this sequel that we were doing a film that may well result in the last Nazi trial. And that would be a good story. You know. Uh, now, I know this is Columbus weekend. So serendipity comes to mind. So what happened was we started making one film. And we got diverted. Now, normally, when you're making a film, 90% of it should be planned. planned. <laughs> They're not normally voyages up the Potomac. <laughs> uh, this turned out to be a bit of a voyage up the Potomac, uh, or maybe up the Mississippi, really. Um, and I, as I said, when we met Irene in the summer of 2016, 2015, 16, uh, at the trial, we thought that was going to be... Your story. Your yeah. story. Yeah. And that was going to lead, that was going to be yeah. the first act, and our woman, hopefully, in terms yeah. of making the film, would be also brought to justice. And that Tommy would be there, maybe as a witness, but certainly as somebody who could say, I was in Bergen-Belsen, 
because this woman also said that she never smelt any death in Bergen-Belsen and that she made soup for the prisoners on the death march. And though the Germans never discovered any evidence that prisoners were killed on the first seven days of the Gross Rosen death march, it's pretty clear that bad behavior didn't start when she left after seven days. Yeah. So, to cut a long story short, we went with the flow of the story. Now, normally I wouldn't like that. Normally mm -hmm. I wouldn't recommend that to be, to be the way, because executive producers and funders hate the notion of, I've got another idea. <laughs> and uh, but, but when we saw what was happening in Europe, and when he was saying to me, there are parallels. I have a unique perspective. I have a unique perspective, as he says, I'm entitled because of what I witnessed as, as a boy and what I survived, I'm entitled to say Europe should be very concerned about what's happening. So uh, Now, we, this, this, in 2016, we didn't know about what was going to happen in the United States. Mm. But that's, that's why we're here today. We, we may come on to that, yeah. <laughs> and I mean, one of, the, one, of the, yeah, one of the reasons you took this this detour, if you like, is because what was unfolding in Europe with the refugee crisis. Yeah. But just to touch on, I mean, Tommy, you started off this this second film, the second part of your journey, looking for, I suppose, accountability, not to put words in your mouth, from this, this woman who was there. Were you disappointed when that didn't happen? Or were how did you feel about this, this new journey that the film took, the new direction that you went in? First of all, I, I did not... Um uh, in the quest to meeting her and everything, I didn't, it wasn't something that I wanted to accuse her of anything. But uh, because uh, she gave a lot of interviews before I met her, and she get, gave testimony uh, to Belgian Belsen archive, and in none of them, she ever showed any regret or she said sorry for what happened. Here we are, there is the, one of the last perpetrators and one of the last victims. Have the opportunity to meet. And I hope that she will say to me, you know, Tommy, it, what happened uh, was very wrong. That once in a lifetime I gave her opportunity to show some regret. But obviously, she wasn't able to do this. And it didn't happen. I didn't meet her, even though if I remember we were in Israel in the airport, and we get an email, uh, Hilda is not going to meet you. And we, we were waiting for the plane to go to Hanover uh, to meet uh, Hilda, and of course, she wouldn't meet us. Here I am, and uh, I, this thing is unfolding in Europe uh, with the refugees. And I said to Jerry, you know, in the late 1930s, when the Jews wanted to escape Europe, nobody wanted us. I mean, we, we also remember that uh, in Cuba there was a ship here in that America, the Americans yeah. wouldn't take Americans the, didn't take the, the refugee, yeah. and they returned, and most of them Died, uh, yeah. perished. Yeah. So here I see a repeat of what happened in 1939. In other words, the people forgot after 70 years. They forgot, and uh, history is repeating itself. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, you have the situation that the uh, rise of racism in Europe, rise of anti-Semitism in Europe. So it is a repeat. We, we are living in very dangerous time. And, and since, since your film yeah. um, in Poland, I couldn't help but think, the Polish government just this, this year... This film would be banned in Poland. Yeah, just, yeah. Tr just attempted to pass a law, the new right-wing government in Warsaw to make it a criminal offence to accuse the po po Poland, uh, Polish, Poland of complicity with Nazi crimes. I mean, it's exactly what you touch on on the film Absolutely. actually uh, happened just this year. So if anything, things have got maybe worse since your film. Well, the other thing that's important in the film, and I, 
we, when Tommy said to me, again, it's, a, it's an indication of none of this was storyboarded. Tommy said, I'm after getting a letter from a, a sheikh in a, in a mosque. He wants me to go and speak at the mosque. And I said, oh, yeah. And I said, that's a good one. <laughs> and um, I said, well, we'll have, to, we'll have to include that in the film, uh, because that's certainly a surprise. And I went out to see the imam, and I said, right, I don't, tell, um, don't tell Tommy, I said, but it's his 80th birthday coming up. I want you to stage the event for the 80th birthday. I believe in being an interventionist director. <laughs> And I said, I want you to celebrate his birthday. And he said, you know, what's, what date is his birthday? And I said, the 26th of June. And he said, the 26th of June is the end of Ramadan. And I said, well, that sounds like a good night for <laughs> 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 And that, I mean, you, you make your, I have a saying, you make your own look. Yeah. Well, here was a chin. What a, what a surprise. What a surprise. Yeah. Very early on in the film, you have a unique scene where a Holocaust survivor is yeah. welcomed. And also, Suzanne, you're, you're former European correspondent mm. as well as the current Washington correspondent. It's a, I'd say it's an eye-opener for a lot of people outside of Ireland to see. Yeah. Uh, that's modern Ireland too. Uh, on Sullis New, have us here tonight yeah. to shed light on the new Ireland. That scene is shot in a community where maybe 20 to 30% of the population are born outside of the Irish Republic. You know, you have to realize that 17% of the population at the last census were born outside the Irish Republic. This is, so that scene Ireland in the mosque, has changed. Ireland has yeah. changed. Yeah. Tommy's a citizen since 1977. Uh, when Tommy applied to join uh, the, uh, the citizenship of the Irish Republic, uh, they were more or less asking, why do you want to be a citizen of the Irish Republic? <laughs> there was no queue. No immigration. Now, there are big events in conference halls all over the country. And people pledge their loyalty to the new Irish, the Irish Republic and are proud to be citizens yeah. of the Irish Republic. That was one of the more powerful or positive scenes yeah. in, the, in the entire film. And Irene, can I, can I bring Irene you in? Was, and maybe Irene is very important because yeah. Irene, again, there was no, the day we were in Lunenburg, this is how lucky we are, I'll let you in now, Irene. Uh, the day we were in Lunenburg, we only arrived a half an hour before. Uh, Groening come out of the out of his trial, and you could be waiting there for days, yeah. waiting for a shot. But Hans Jorgen, a very good friend of Irene, and Irene's son Ron, there, uh, Hans Jorgen said, "Get down quickly to the courtroom because that Groening way. could well." Yeah. And that's, and that's where, where we met, met Irene. I was going to ask a story about at how you met Irene. Maybe you just tell us briefly about your own past. You have a fascinating story as well. You're also a Holocaust survivor who ended up living in the United States. Maybe briefly you could tell us a bit about your life. Well, I, my family got caught up in what is now called the Hungarian Holocaust. It, it has become separated or added two to the other, but it didn't happen until 1944, a, a year before the war was over. And so, although we've had many problems in Hungary where we lived uh, because they were allies of the Nazis and they Im implemented all the Nuremberg type laws, you know, even before we were taken away. But we thought that we would, uh, the war was almost over and that we would not be taken. And so when it did happen, uh, they had to rush to get it done because there was very little time. And actually, they were losing the war by then. So we were deported to Auschwitz family. We lived in a small farming town. And uh, my parents were in their middle 40s. There were six children between the ages of seven and 17. Um, I was 13, 13 and a half. We were um, plucked out of our home in taken to a ghetto. After that, we were transported in cattle cars to Auschwitz. The story is well documented. Um, with, your with your family? With the, my, our fam my family, yes. And um, you know, when we arrived, we, we had no idea where we were. And even though the war had been going on and there was um, a lot of killing in Auschwitz, we had never heard of Auschwitz. So when we arrived there, we had no idea where we were, and uh, 
things happen so fast uh, after getting out of the, of the train, of the cattle car, within minutes we were separated, torn apart. And, uh, you know, it, 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 we, I was in the daze, <laughs> and it, 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 it was so fast and, and, and so abrupt that it, it, it didn't register very much. It, it, it was just, uh, you go here and you go there, and all of a sudden, I was left holding my younger sister's hand, and the Nazi separated me from her. She was about 12. And everybody else was already gone. And so I, I realized that something is very wrong here. They're, they're not trying to keep mother and children together, as I had witnessed ahead of me. But here she was going to be alone without anyone. And she, we have no documents of any kind. And suddenly it occurred to me, uh, there is some big problem here. <laughs> and so the picture that I saw here and is available, uh, it was taken by the Nazis. It happens to be of me as I was separated from everyone. And I was so stunned that I didn't move. I remained on the side there looking to see if my younger sister caught up with our mom because I couldn't see. And then I was motioned to follow the so-called young adults who uh, ended up in slave labor. So that was the end of, of my childhood and the beginning of an, of a, an experience that um, I seared in my mind. And you worked then in slave labor at the camp? Yes, um, my sister <coughs> was 17. She was the one who was first separated. And I joined her. Uh, I, we were, uh, worked in Auschwitz for eight months okay. un until the uh, evacuation. Because uh, as you say, it was towards the end of the war when, when the Hungarian uh, yeah. the deportation started to happen. Well, when, when the Russian army yeah. approached and Auschwitz was uh, emptied and we ended up on a death march, what we heard about and saw in the movie, uh, we were dragged through uh, days and days in the winter of 1945, January. And how did you end up in the US, <laughs> briefly? Well, when we were finally li liberated, it was the day the, the war was over in May, we were far into Germany, actually not far from Hamburg, where I later on, many years later, ended up in a courtroom as a, yeah. and a, as a, a, a witness to uh, and the trial of the two Nazis. So we were very, very far from home, and uh, the Russian army <laughs> liberated us, but we were in a small camp where typhus had broken out and we were in terrible shape. So when the Russian soldiers came by, they saw that this was a dangerous place and they just didn't even come in. They left, they were afraid of the typhus. So we were left and unfortunately what happened after the liberation, since we didn't get any help of any kind, food or medical care, an awful lot of people died after liberation. Mm -hmm. And so the journey home just added to that of people dying al along the way because uh, there was no facility, nobody cared, nobody helped us. And months and months of hitchhiking, walking, and all kinds of ways until we found ourselves in Prague, Czechoslovakia. And from there you eventually went to the eventually United States. Eventually things got better. And then in America. Um, what do you, I mean, at the moment, um, just talking about the parallels at the moment, and, um, and I mean, I'm conscious, you said this at the beginning, Jerry, when you walked in, saying somebody said it's been a, a terrible day in Washington, and you <laughs> kind of said, get, get a bit of perspective. But I suppose we are living in, in a country now where the President of the United States has talked about a Muslim ban, you know, a specifically restricting immigration to certain religions. Yeah. Um, 
And that's one of the themes that you seem to be dealing with all the time, Tommy, saying to different religions, you know, these different people you meet in Dublin and Srebrenica, um, you know, this could be you. It, it could be Muslim. It, it could be against Muslim. It could be, you know, just pro-Christian. It could be, you know, that kind of link. Where do you see things at the moment in terms of, um, not just in America, but in the West, if you like, this kind of movement back, retreat into nationalism, retreat behind borders, uh, retreat into, into homogenous ways of life. Um, are you very pessimistic at the moment, Tommy? Unfortunately, I am. But, uh, uh, you know, it, it's not a big problem. Because if we, if we think about Europe as a whole, it has over 500 million inhabitants. Uh, we have the European uh, EU that we work together. When it's come to a problem like this, suddenly there is no cooperation. Yeah. And if there was cooperation, and each country would take so many people <laughs> I'm not a campaigner for refugees or anything like this, but I see it very unhuman when you see people uh, drowning in the, the sea and they're not coming to, to Europe to better their life. They're coming to Europe because they're looking for a sanctuary to have a life. And we have to help them. Unfortunately, when individual country take the brunt of the responsibility, and I'm talking about Germany, Germany Italy, yeah. Greece. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very unhealthy situation, because in years to come, if these people are not integrated into the society, we will find ourselves in very big problem. And of course, we see the problem now that the right-wing parties yeah. are getting into power. It's very dangerous. And just to explain to people, because we're here in America, like what you're referring to is when this refugee crisis hit its, its peak a couple of years ago, the European Union, which is supposed to be this collection of countries, was completely paralyzed. And mm. it, you know, became, it started infighting. And you had certain countries said, we don't want to take refugees. And you had other countries, particularly Germany, said, well, we do. And then I think it exposed the limitations of the European Union and the moral failures, if you like, that the European Union, this collection of 500 million people, couldn't get together a, 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 a strategy. Yeah. Um, and as you say now, the result, unfortunately, has been the rise of right-wing governments in places like uh, yeah, Poland and, and in response. Eastern Europe, which gets a bad well, press Suzanne, here. But, Suzanne, yeah. there's, a, there's a point that's important to make. In all of the countries of Eastern Europe, where you have the rise of uh, you know, in Hungary and Poland, in Slovakia, we saw the, you know, okay, it's, it's, it's the rise of Kotlib, but from nothing to 10%, though he did lose the governorship after Tommy visited the, the town. <laughs> um, when, we, when, when Jan Gross talks about dealing with the past in Eastern Europe, it also, it's dealing with the fact that where there was large-scale collaboration with the Nazi project, the communist era allowed people to suppress the dealing with the past. And it's in the countries where there was mass collaboration that, that there is this, the greatest resistance to refugees. Now, what we were... We never set out to make a film with the modest aim of emphasising the common bonds of humanity. But at the end of the day, that's what the film's about, the common bonds of humanity. It seems strange that that's a radical proposition today. But that's what all it is, that underneath everything we're the same. And also one of the themes, I think, is you know, the power of testimony yeah. and of truth and of facts, which, of course, again, we're living in a world where those things seem to be negotiable now. But this idea that you said Eisenhower, I think, he said, take as many pictures as you can, people will not believe this. But the idea, I mean, you're an actual, you two are actual witnesses. Uh, so many characters. Peter Kubitschek said that in the film. Peter died in New York in December. Oh. Peter, unlike Tom, Peter was on the same transport to Bergen Belsen as Tommy. And they met in New York about two years yeah, ago. Yeah. And uh, couldn't get it into the film that 
Anyway, that's another story. <laughs> but, um, film, the next film. Yeah, but P Peter, unlike Tommy, Peter was fr Peter, another Slovak uh, Jewish man. He could never set foot in Germany. Whereas Tommy... Uh, in Slovakia either. Or in Slovakia either. Mm -hmm. So Peter Wait, was a man he so forgive. traumatized. He, could, he couldn't forgive what happened? No, he not move like on. Tommy. Yeah. yeah. Peter, Peter ended his days in New York. He was a guide in the Metropolitan Museum. Um, lovely man. Um, but unlike Tommy, he could not contemplate going back to Germany or returning to his homeland. Tommy has on his, on his uh, lapel here a badge given to him by the president of Germany. And that's Tommy's way of, of reach, when he, Tommy says he's reaching out. If the other side says, look, we're going to build bridges, we're going to acknowledge the past. And that's why Tommy, I'm, not, I'm speaking for you here, but. Yeah. <laughs> Tommy accepted the award, and the German ambassador, when he, uh, this is the, Tommy was awarded about three years ago, the highest award, civil award, award that the German state can give. And, <laughs> and that was basically because he travels all over Ireland and to places like this to give a simple message. I was that kid who was singled out roughed up, imprisoned, nearly died. 35 of us were killed. Six million of us were, was, were liquidated. Never let it happen again. And I think some of the stronger things in the film, things that you never could have put on a storyboard, just the same with the young girl in the village. And just to remind the American audience, that young girl is the great granddaughter of Hans Ludin. So when she says to Tommy, and you, you want to speak about that, when she says to Tommy, I'm going to tell my children and grandchildren about you, that's the great-granddaughter of the guy who sent Tommy's people to their doom, promising that she will take up the burden of history. And Tommy, can you talk about that? Was that an important moment for you? It was, and uh, you know, many people ask me, why did I break down? And the simple reason was, that she's German. And in my mind, when I'm speaking and when I'm talking about that there is less and less of us, eventually in the next uh, 10, 15 years, there won't be any of us. Who should take the responsibility to tell the world the, what happened? And the only people I feel are the Germans. They have to take it from us, that they have to say it did happen. Holocaust is a true thing because, of course, after all of us is gone, the deniers will come and they will be talking. And this was rehearsed or prepared. And here this German girl is telling me exactly what I want to hear. And I just found it so emotional that I couldn't, I, I broke down. Well, it, the uh, generation of the Nazis, the perpetrators, they never told their people after the war what their role was in it. It was not permitted in those homes to bring up the topic. I heard it over and over that in, at the kitchen table, if one of the uh, children asked the question, it was not, it, it was, they were told this is not a topic that we, we should ever ask about or talk about. So it, it, they didn't know really what happened. And I hear now that the, the children and the grandchildren of these people are searching the archives to find what their parents and grandparents did, what their role was, because they are very upset. They, did not know that after the war that their, the perpetrators melted into the, into the villages, into the towns. They got jobs as before. Everything was hush-hush. Nobody was allowed to ask the questions and talk about it. 
And now that the young people are old enough, they want to know. They want to know their heritage, where they come from, and how, what happened to the point where uh, I, I know some of these young people who actually wonder when they find out the terrible murders and, and uh, sufferings they, their elders created, they wonder if something in their genes yeah. of, this, uh, of this killing, uh, fee, you know, the, this cruelty yeah. might have been passed down to them. They're said, so upset finding out that their parents and grandparents could have been so cruel and so fiendish and so evil that they're worried that somehow they're tainted for life. I think you'll also agree, Irene, it was important that we had people like Hans Jorgen in the film. He was very helpful to you in terms of the groaning trial and yes. dealing with, you know, he was a German yes. yeah. whose father was a 110% Nazi. Yes. And he was important for the, his moral, his moral courage was also important to put on display in the yeah, film. He, he was a very powerful. Said, you know, I, I heard the German official speak to a group of survivors that I was part of. He said, for the rest of history, that my country will be known about the evil that they created. Yeah. So that was an official. But the perpetrators, the people who really did this terrible evil, they did not take any responsibility. Mm -hmm. They were not tried. They were not made to pay. The country and, and did. It's like Germany did take this responsibility, and it still does. But the individuals, not it, so well, much. Well, very few. There were a few yeah. trials. Yeah. But then it was it stopped. Yeah. Yeah. Because they were trying to do the law in the way that wasn't possible to to. Um, the, the law required that uh, the, the victims and the perpetrators should have met and recognized each other and pointed each other out because they remembered or, was, or something was done to them pers in, in person. And that was impossible for uh, yeah. now. And so all the trials were dismissed because the, um, the witnesses didn't qualify they didn't recognize the perpetrators. So when I testified at the trial, finally, uh, the man was uh, in his 90s. But the, the law had changed, the, the German law. They realized that if they persist in insisting that the victim and the victimizer should know details about each other and not have known each other, that. We'll ne they'll never find anybody. Okay. And so the law changed to, to say that if, for example, in my uh, situation, that I came from Hungary to Auschwitz in May of 1944. And this guy, Groening, was an officer who was stationed at the, st at the uh, platform as the trains arrived. And that he was there when I was there. And therefore, I can tell what he did and other soldiers did without saying that I recognize him. Oh, yeah. I was there, and I could explain what happened to mm -hmm. the, uh, the separation and the, uh, and the killing that followed. And so that was enough to um, charge him with you know, being part of the perpetrators, part of the, the criminal who yeah. helped. We might just open up for a couple of questions. There's probably lots, but um, just if maybe, just if you just wait for the microphone for one second. Have we got the microphone? <coughs> Here. Thank you very much for making this film. It speaks to me personally, I'm a Holocaust survivor of, of Hamburg. In 1938, my father, who was not Jewish, was tied to a lamppost and beaten almost to death because the Nazis wanted to force him to leave his Jewish family. He did not do so, and uh, he was forced to go into the army 
and stationed in Belgium, where he was part of the underground uh, in saving Belgian Jews, and he was uh, arrested by the Gestapo and sent to prison. In the meantime, we were living in Hamburg. In 1941, 47 members of my family were transported to Minsk in Belarusia, where they were shot and dumped into a mass grave. We were free, in quotes, until 1943 because of the Nuremberg laws that allowed Aryan spouses married to Jewish sp uh, people before 1935, they were exempt until 1943 uh, from being deported. In, in the summer of 1943, my mother got deportation orders for herself and my two sisters and me for Theresienstadt. Sh two days after this deportation order, the Allies bombed Hamburg to smithereens and we survived the Holocaust and the firestorm of Hamburg because about 60,000 bodies were burned to a crisp and the neighborhood where we lived was totally destroyed and dead bodies charred uh, to a crisp, unidentifiable, and we were able to go into hiding through the underground. My father's brothers were members of the underground, uh, two of them in France, and they were shot while they were trying to escape from camp. So one of the things that, that I feel very strongly, I became a citizen in America because I'm anti-nationalist, of any nation, I do not believe in nationalism. I became an American citizen because I uh, became active in the civil rights movement in, in America when I arrived in New York. And I was often arrested and the question was uh, whether I was American and it became an expedient uh, thing to become an American citizen. What is happening now in the United States is so horrific and so reminiscent of my childhood. I've been in a state of depression since the summer of 2016 and even before. And in 2016, we were walking down uh, the promenade along the Potomac River. And I said to my husband, Daniel, I said, I can hear my parents talking in the early 30s saying this cannot be happening. We are better than this, we are smarter than this, we are not going to go the route of what is happening in the United States. We are now in a country where a person, a victim of a crime is being mocked by the president of that country. This is intolerable and one of the things that we have to learn and told me, you, you did this, I, I do the same thing. I talk to Muslim students, to black students, all the time, even in Germany. I go, I go back to Germany and talk to students. One of the things that I feel very strongly is if we do not connect with one another globally, all of us, if we do not talk to each other, if we do not re use respect and tolerance with one another, we are all going to sink because we are all in the same boat and if we don't row together, we are all going to drown. And I think we are living in, in a moment of such existential crisis that uh, I, I, I am extremely pessimistic. I do not see how we can get out of this uh, deep morass of racism, bigotry, uh, and hatred. And I hope that you know, somebody uh, can come along and have an answer to how we can overcome. Thank you, and thank you okay. again. Thank you very much. <laughs> 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 
maybe we only have time for one, one. One more question, um, because we're running out of time, if anyone. Can, yes, this lady here. I think we have a microphone. Oh, sorry. Oh. Anyone else? Okay. We may just leave it at that, because that was so powerful the last... Uh, yeah. I think everyone else has been stunned into silence. <laughs> we yes. weren't expecting that, that uh, yeah. commentary. So thanks very much for that. So look, Can I just add, yes, just add something? Last word to you, La uh, may, uh, Maybe last word, <laughs> but I'll give it back to, to yourself, Suzanne. But two points. Guys like Sami Ayub, the Syrian lad that we met in Lunenburg, Obviously, he can't come to America, and that's America's loss. Here's a guy who reads Ernest Hemingway, and that kept him going through the terror of uh, Bashar al-Assad's regime, and then ISIS, and the Islamic fascist state that was constructed in northern Syria. Now, he is a contributor to Germany. Yeah. He's Syria's loss, he's Germany's gain, and the United States has blocked guys like him coming to America. That's America's loss. Yeah. So, finally, uh, could I just say that th this was the first public screening, but those of you who are subscribers to Amazon Prime can see it in, in the United States, because in recent weeks they have the license for it for the next three years. So would you please tell anyone who has a subscription to Amazon Prime that there's a good movie on? And it has a full. It's it has surprises, and at its bottom line is the common bonds of humanity. Thank you very much, and um, thank you to our three. Our panel is here, and thank you very much to Solis Nua for organising this, and Culture Ireland, and and thank you again for a very moving and and powerful movie. Thank you.